Actually, one. Two. Three. One. Two. Three. One. Okay. Two. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another great episode of Not Your Father's Movies. I'm Mike. I'm Vito. And I'm Jesse, and we are the Dad Fathers, coming at you with some sleepy dad energy. So <laughs> sleepy. So sleepy. And today, we are joined by a very special guest, a friend to the pod. Sir, sir, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine, and I'm in the central time zone two hours ahead of all of you. So, <laughs> speaking of tired, yeah, I'm here as well. <laughs> you have got the sleepiest dad energy. Um, that's awesome. Well, today, we're here to talk about... A movie that's all about sleep, I guess? I don't know. What is this movie about? It's called The Big Sleep. This is a big movie. This is the one from 1946. Indeed. Not the one from the 70s with Robert Mitchum. This stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. And uh, before we get into the cast and crew, though, sir, I want to talk a little bit about about you and about your podcast. Because, Vito, I know you were on the podcast, My Movie Fix, before talking about Promising Young Woman. Indeed. Um, and I want to just hear a little bit about the podcast that you're doing. And yeah, Vito was actually stuff. the inaugural guest. That's right. Um, Ooh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, I, I used to have a podcast with two other hosts maybe two years ago, and we, you know, it kind of fell apart. And I missed it. I missed, you know, I need, I needed my fix. So started a new podcast called My Movie Fix, where I just, I get my fix out, and I like to talk about movies. So that's what I did. So started that back up. Vito was my first guest, talking promising young woman. I have no idea when this episode comes out, but there should be maybe four or so by then. So yeah, check it out. It was, awesome. it was a really, really great um, experience talking with you, and I, I was really happy that we were able to talk about that one. Uh, I know you were like slightly less happy. Spoilers for the episode, <laughs> but it was still a great like conversation. I really enjoyed myself. I really, speaking for myself, I really enjoyed listening to it. I felt like both of you guys expressed things that I thought about the movie better than I could have expressed it, oh. um, which was really cool to hear because I'm on a podcast expressing my thoughts. It just makes me feel great. <laughs> just, you know, s- slight spoilers, but I didn't care for it and kind of talking to him, it kind of, you know, it helped shape why I felt how I felt and kind of understood why he liked it, why he liked, why he liked what he liked better. So yeah, great conversation. Check it out. Cool. Yeah, 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 please. And cool. we, we we all follow each other on social media, and um, you can find you can find all of that there. We'll obviously post the my movie fix, yeah, um, along with this episode. So, yeah, sorry, Absolutely. Jesse, I cut you off. I was just gonna say that even though I record a movie podcast, I don't really listen to a whole lot of movie podcasts. <laughs> but from stuff that I've heard, like my movie fix and the promising young woman episode was was really great. Like I genuinely enjoyed all of it and wanted to hear more. I haven't heard the rest of your episode since then. Yeah. I'm probably going to go only check one other out. one at this time. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And, and sir, you also have something else that you're doing, right? Is is this something you want to talk oh. about in this space or? Yeah, I mean, so I do woodworking. That's my my side hobby. Like I I work in IT as my main job, forty hours a week podcasting a couple hours a week, but I only do those once every other week right now, just because time is crazy. I do woodworking. I got a baby on the way sometime Ooh, nice. in the next month and a half. I'll have two kids. So yeah, oh, it's nice. a lot. <laughs> month and a half. Yeah. Uh, woodworking, making cutting boards. That's kind of my, I don't know, my hobby. My, when I, you know, I put my home, headphones on, zone out, you know, that's kind of my, it relaxes me. So yeah. They're beautiful. What, what you've been posting, they're beautiful. Appreciate it. You use I'm like kinda, cool wood too, right? Like different yeah, all Yeah, of... all exotic woods, no stains. They're all, you know, I have anything on my website or on my Instagram. It's something made by me, you know, so I'm, I'm really enjoying it. My website will be live, you know, check out my Instagram, Sirs Furniture, S-I-R-S Furniture. So you'll check out all my, my cutting boards, my art, anything I make out of wood. Find me there as well. So you... appreciate the, the plug. Do you do any, like, wedding gift sort of cutting boards? You know, the type that have the initials in there and all that? Yeah, that's one of my bigger ones I made. If you go back on my Instagram, posted it white and red. Got uh, maple, sapelli, bloodwood, babinga. It's got, like, six woods in it. It's really, really big, really pretty. I gave it to my friend as a wedding gift. He likes to barbecue a lot. So, uh, yeah, so if you guys are interested in 
wedding gifts and all that kind of stuff, check me out. And I know I'm, I actually got a few orders right now for Father's Day gifts. This will come out after that, obviously, but it's keeping me busy. Uh, nice. So I'm, I'm enjoying it right now. Just so if, if you like cutting things, <laughs> <laughs> Sir's gotcha. And that's Sir Two R's. Right, Sir right. Two R's Furniture. Awesome. We're, we're really stoked that you're here. I'm excited to uh, to talk about the big sleep with you. Dude. This has been coming for a little while, so we're, we're glad we're glad to get started. So, getting started. Vito, can you tell us a little bit about the cast and the crew here? So, The Big Sleep, directed by Howard Hawks. He's kind of one of the more well-known, but not well-known, ancient Hollywood directors. Not ancient. Golden. Golden is the nice way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> He ended his career with Rio Lobo, but he's also known for El Dorado, yeah. Atari, Rio Bravo. A personal favorite. Yeah. A lot of these are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Red River, Sergeant York, for which he was nominated for Best Director. Oh, really? His Girl Friday, Bringing Up Baby, and he's also an uncredited director on The Thing from Another World, which is the basis for Invasion of the Body Snatchers in the 60s, 70s, and then The Thing, John Carpenter's movie. So, oh, dang. yeah, he's got a deep history. He was around for a long, long time. Um, working in silent films, moving into talkies, and then trying to like frame how Hollywood would continue. I like how you said talkies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I've been doing a deep dive in a lot of silent film stories. Well, he Sorry, like he kind of invented how people would talk on film. Like he was one of the people on the I don't know what to call it. Forefront. Yeah, the forefront. forefront. On the that cutting thing. edge. The cutting edge. Yeah. The cutting forefront. edge of movies and how like no one had any idea what dialogue would sound like to people listening to it through video format he came up with how to write a good script for that and how to direct that so yeah this dude is super innovative for the entire hollywood industry yeah absolutely and in that way too he also kind of crafted the early talky stars right along with john ford he also worked with john wayne a lot uh worked with him five times including the lay bracket trilogy of rio bravo el dorado and rio lobo and it's a lo- the the lay bracket trilogy she worked on all of them, but they're all also basically the same movie, right? They are. They yeah, are. They're, okay. they're, they're essentially remade scripts of Rio Bravo. Right. And Rio Bravo itself was a reaction to High Noon, which John Wayne thought was communist when he was offered it and would not be a part of it. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so they get, they get uh, Jules Furthman and Leigh Brackett to, to come on because Howard Hawks had heard... Well, he, actually, at the time Rio Bravo came out, he'd already worked with her in The Big Sleep, but... She worked with him a lot. He really trusted her, which is really weird at the time to trust a, a female screenwriter, especially in these like macho men kind of movies. And kind of a big reason is, as he said, she wrote like a man, which was good. <laughs> <laughs> that was a compliment yeah. back then. It, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Tough look for my guy Hawks. But this lay bracket trilogy of, of them working together, she was kind of not really on board for doing the second and third Eldorado and Rio Lobo. She, she kind of felt forced into it. But Howard Hawks and John Wayne both looked at her and said, if it worked once and it was good, why wouldn't it work again? <laughs> so <laughs> she wrote them with it. But herself, she is a very influential writer at that time in Hollywood. And I, is a, I'm a big personal fan of her work. I actually read um, No Good Comes from a Corpse, which was her the novel that got Howard Hawks's attention. It's really hard to find. The one I got, I got on eBay and I couldn't ever get rid of it because it had no publisher on it. It, it, there was no publisher listed, so I could never sell it anywhere because no bookstore would take a book that was had Wait, no publisher. Real quick, so Lee Brackett, she was a sci-fi writer before she started out in The Big Sleep, right? She was a sci-fi writer, and as she said, she became a writer to make money. And when she started out in the sci-fi space, she couldn't write fast enough to make good money. And the stories she was putting out were going out to too small of an audience, so she moved over into noir and crime. Because that was a way to make money. And that's where she really starts to, to take off with, from this one book that got her a lot of respect. Um, it's, it's very good. I don't know if, how you can find it now unless you buy it on eBay, but it, I, I was really impressed by it. She worked with Howard Hawks four times. She worked with him on those four John Wayne movies, only missing the Red River collaboration. But she also wrote The Long Goodbye, Robert Altman's 1970s look at the noir genre, which is also about Philip Marlowe and also based on a Raymond Chandler novel. <laughs> So she has roots going all the way back, you know, to these these 40s serials. And then coming forward, she's also a credited screenwriter on Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. She, she had the first drafts, and the movie came out two years after her death from cancer, unfortunately. But um, she got her start here. And what boggles my mind is the other writer for this movie 
It's William Faulkner. Like, he's a famous novelist. Like, how... The literary giant, <laughs> William Faulkner. <laughs> and, like, she's getting her start in a movie, like, with this giant, and she has her name right next to his. That is insane to me. Isn't that, like, the ideal writer? I, I don't know what the ideal is for any movie writer, but it seems like that's it. Ex yeah. Except he did not care very much, <laughs> is the problem. He wrote these movies for money, and the way that she describes Most their... Most people yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> but he could not support himself with his award-winning, culture-changing novels and had to go and write these movies. Their collaboration process was she walked in, he comes out of his office, sets a book down, sets the big sleep down, says, I have sectioned off chapters for us to work on. Here are your chapters. I'll be taking my chapters. And he left and he shut the door to his office. <laughs> and they never spoke again about it and just turned in their drafts to Howard Hawks when they kind of stitched them together. That's what Jules Firthman did is he came on to sort of make it flow more cohesively and also chop down the end of it because it was too long. Because guess what? It's Faulkner. Of course it's too long. <laughs> That's just hilarious. That's amazing. It's hard to believe that the writer of Sound of and the Fury didn't make enough money you know, selling books. That's right. But I mean, like, I've read Sound and the Fury, and I'm reading it, and I'm going, yeah, this is obviously not a bestseller. Like, yeah. bro, you got a two-page sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the final guy I did want to mention is is Jules Firthman. She worked with him again on Rio Bravo. He also had a very long career going way back to 1915 as his first credited work. And Rio Bravo was his final film, and he passed 10 years later. In his career, he had 120 screenwriting credits, including a little movie called Nightmare Alley, which Guillermo del Toro has remade and will be released later this year. Whoa. So I don't know what that's going to be. I haven't seen that movie. <laughs> but he also wrote Mutiny and the Bounty, for which he was nominated for Adapted Screenplay at the Oscars, and To Have and Have Not, the direct predecessor to The Big Sleep, the one that launched the Bogey and Bacall train on all of us. <laughs> right. I didn't know there was a train... This is my first Humphrey Bogart movie ever, you know, so this is all this is all brand new to me. I, I didn't watch, you know, older movies too often, you know, unless, you know, my, my dad was watching something, I'd watch them with him. But and then I started doing my research after this, and, you know, apparently they got together and were married for forever. And, you know, their, their son, like, sells liquor now. It's like there's a whole, like, the whole Hollywood story or whatever. I, I didn't know any of this. And so... Thanks for, you know, opening my eye to that, just FYI. It, it, well, was she the second of four? How many wives did he have? I'm not sure. She was okay. the last. She was the last. Yeah. So she we're going to count that one. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. I didn't know it was that. Like a, it was like a 30-year age gap or something like that. 25 was, years. Uh, it was yeah. pretty big. Yeah. Very Laura busy McCall man. is the, the fourth wife of Humphrey Bogart. Okay. She said in an interview that when she was doing movies with Bogart, she had heard that his current wife, who was an alcoholic and kind of a little crazy, was insanely jealous of anybody who touched Bogart. So she touched him a and whole lot. And she touched him a whole lot. And, <laughs> and, and then he started, like, randomly kissing her, like, to say goodbye and stuff. And then mm. she's just like, oh, man, we're, we're in for some deep shit. And then... Bogey's pulling into the station. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And then Bogart like got divorced, and then that same year he marries like I think it's like eleven days later he marries uh, Lauren Bacall. And they they'd already been romantically late. Yeah. Tangled. Prior to that, yeah, entangled. They've been, in a nice they've way. been doing some horse racing. <laughs> so, they, perhaps. <laughs> uh, yeah, lots of horse racing. But lots to talk about racing. Humphrey's career, I call him Humphy. He's <laughs> one of the weirdest most like unconventionally attractive leading men i yeah. think that's been around like john wayne he's a big fella but he, he's he's got rugged good looks he looks like he's he's been made out of a block of wood you know but humphrey has these these big these yeah. eyes these like bloodhound eyes you know he's got kind of a long he's got jowls and the fact that he was such a star is really surprising to me i asked my wife we're watching this i said is that dude attractive she goes <laughs> yeah yeah, I think, yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, I actually heard a reason for this. It's because this is during the 1940s, during uh, World War II. So all of the A-list actors were either at war or making some uh, some World War II movies. So that dried up the pool of actors in Hollywood, which left people like B-list actors like Humphrey Bogart. Huh. It makes sense. That yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, there's no there's no copper. There's a gas shortage, and we got Humphrey Bogart as their marquee star. You know, yeah. <laughs> but he's a good like he's a good star though. Like he he's is. a good 
He's a good leading man. And I wonder if that's a part of it, too. Like, there's just all these movies that have him as just, like, women can't keep their hands off of him. Clearly. And so we have now sort of, like... Such as this movie. Yeah, such as this movie. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, like, like, maybe that's just, like, seeped its way into our subconscious, and now he's sort of become the mythical, bad-looking, you know, attractive... Everyone's Dude. everyone's got to wear like a tan suit. Their pants way too high. <laughs> you know that that that's what women want. You have to look like harried and and just a little a total... little sad. You've yeah. seen you see, you look like an yeah. old shoe. You know? <laughs> you know what's funny is even in this movie they're making fun of the way he looks like almost the entire movie. Like he opens up, it's like, oh, you're really short. short. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. He said his name is Doghouse. <laughs> uh, sir, did you were you compelled by by Humphreys? hang dog screen presence uh not particularly you know <laughs> oh, not, okay. not, not my thing but it, i really like this type of movie to where you know the main guy is just irresistible to women you know it's just something about that that genre of you know the guy walks into a bar and you know, get off me, <laughs> you, know it's, you know it's just um, this this era of movies the black and white kind of you know i don't know i really like this genre you know yeah the noir type but the mood oh yeah before we move though i would like to mention we got to talk about lauren bacall here um, oh yeah born 25 years after her eventual husband bogey he was born in 1899 just to really wow. date him <laughs> wow she was born betty joan persk she also co-starred with john wayne in his final film the shootist she won two Tony Awards for her stage work, a Golden Globe, and she got an Academy Award nomination for The Mirror Has Two Faces. She got her start when she caught the attention of a woman named Slim Keith, who at that time was married to Howard Hawks. Lauren Bacall was already a model for Harper's Bazaar. She was on the, the cover of it. But it was starring into Have and Have Not for Howard Hawks, who had kind of like mentored her and taught her how to talk. She had, a, I guess, a very high-pitched, nasally voice. And he gave her extensive speech lessons to bring that down to the sort of Bacall that we know, this like smoky, incredibly sultry voice. Yeah. Yeah, he like made her a star and yeah. he put her in his movies and then she she took off. Yeah, and then they remained married until uh, Humphrey Bogart's death in 1957. Um, she had two kids with him. She actually died on my birthday in 2014. Wow. August 12th. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, I have no idea what to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I did hear some some interesting things about her in this movie. Namely, what movie did she get her start in? It was To Have and to Have, have, and have Not. not. Huge Bogey. hit. Like, that brought her into everything, right? After that, can't remember what this movie's called, but she utterly tanked it. Confidential Agent. Confidential right. Agent. Utterly tanked. She kind of uh, lost a lot of street cred in Hollywood. And then they brought her back for this movie because it's another Humphrey Bogart pairing, right? And they thought that'd be a real big draw. Apparently she was terrible at first, so they had to go back and they were pulling for the a lot of scenes to be reshot. In fact, they pulled out a lot of scenes, plot-wise, to give her more of a star, make her more of a star in this movie. Her failure in the last sense. movie is what makes this movie kind of more of a mess in the plot, because <laughs> they had to drive her character more. Uh, you are... You are uh... You are correct in, in, in essence, but actually they made this movie before Confidential Agent. Yeah. They shelved it because the studio was putting out too many, wanted to put out a bunch of war movies at the time. Because the war was ending. So and actually, they had all this stuff uh, on the shelf. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we got to get these out before they go bad. So basically. it's when Confidential Agent bombs, this is going to your point, is when it bombs, they go back in and have to fix it because also in test screenings, the audience really liked the younger sister more. Yeah. <laughs> so Martha they had to remove Vickers? her. Yeah, Martha Vickers Martha had to Vickers take Vickers her out right. and be like, no. No, get her out of here. More more bogey Bacall. More. Because Bacall needs to be yeah. something. Yeah. So they caught a lot of Martha Vickers. Most of her scenes. Yeah. Including some very awkward ones. You can check it out. You can Google that, I'm sure. I don't I don't want to. <laughs> um, <laughs> the famous the infamous horse racing scene, that was added. Mm -hmm. That was added. That was the primary reshoot, I think. That they brought everyone back to do that scene. It is the steamy scene. It, it's the steamiest. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I'm lost. Horse racing scene? Yeah, where they where they talk about horse racing, but it's clearly a double entendre. Yeah. There's like they they go, go back and forth. They for go a while. they go it's like it's this weird sort of cut in between like if you know that it's added to the movie, you realize like it's weirdly added. But I uh it's before they go to the gambling place. 
Oh yeah. They go to dinner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bacall and, and Bogart. Oh, okay. Remember yeah. that? Okay. That, was at, okay. that was at yeah. it. That was at it. And that was, it was actually after they were married. Uh, so yeah. that's part of why it's so steamy. And also, I've got the script up, man. These, these lines, they're too much. <laughs> well, so, so now Jesse's going to read the whole <laughs> script from this scene to us. It's great. I, right. You need to do this the voices. Be a long I, I can't do the voices, but this is Vivian speaking. Well, speaking of horses, I like to play them myself. But I'd like to see them work out a little first to see if they are front runners or come from behind. Find out who they're... Find out what their whole card is. What makes them running? And Marlo says, find out mine. Vivian says, I think so. Marlo says, go ahead, Vivian. I'd say, you don't like to be raided. You like to get out in front, open up a lead, take a little breather in the backstretch, and come home free. <laughs> this is a family-friendly show, mostly. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know why my brain blocked that whole show. I mean, I, I just blocked what I just heard, but I remember it in the movie. <laughs> I don't want to see my friend reading those lines. No, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable seeing those lines yeah. out loud. Did any of you read the book? Yeah, I did. Okay. I read it. I read yeah. it just a few months ago, actually. Yeah, yeah I read it cool. weekend, a half ago, or whatever. Those scenes like that is what kind of stood out to me because that's not in the book. Yeah. And so the whole time I'm watching it, it's like, why did they choose to do this kind of thing? So that, that kind of, I guess I repressed it because I did, did like, it. <laughs> you know. But, that's but awesome. hearing you hearing you guys talk about how you know how they had to pump up her stuff and add extra scenes in that kind of it helps me make sense of why this movie is what it was because i i really do think the book was a whole lot better and the book a lot of issues that i have with this movie weren't in the book and the book's version is better so i'm trying to figure out why they are the way they are but it makes sense it's like hey, we gotta we gotta get her some more star power put her in some more scenes so i guess that makes sense why why it is the way it is some some background politicking yeah oh yeah yeah final note on lauren bacall here before we end this laborious cast and crew segment so before she died i want to talk about something that makes me kind of mad her final credited role is on an episode of family guy oh my gosh that just makes me kind of angry before then she's got she's working on stuff like howl's moving castle Um, she's on jonathan glazer's film birth she's she's in dogville she has the Edward nomination for mirrors two faces she's in misery she's in john wayne's final movie the shooter she's in murder on the orient express like not even yeah. like counting all the Bogart stuff. It, this was a this she was a saved queen. the best for last. <laughs> oh. <laughs> An episode oh. of Family Guy. One episode. One episode. <sighs> are, are you mad at That's Family amazing. Guy or at her? Like, where, where is your <laughs> anger directed? It just seems inappropriate. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> One of the things that's fascinating about these kinds of movies is so much of them at this point, this is, what, 60 years ago that this happened? Part of what's fascinating about them at this point is all of the history that we know about old Hollywood now. And when you watch it, you're you're kind of like, oh, this guy was doing this thing, and like they weren't married yet, and now they are. And I just, I, I always find that fascinating with, with these kinds of movies. But I, I wanted to say a little bit about why we're doing this movie. Because people have told us in the past, sometimes they wonder why we choose the movies that we choose, including a very um, important person here today, (laughs) sir. So thank you for that little note. Uh, (laughs) See, critique us and you'll end up on our show. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, wait. Hold on. Um, Hold on. Wait. I just want to ask her before we continue on. What what was the weirdest choice you think we'd done? So... To to be frank, I've listened to most of your episodes, but the movies I've never heard of, I skip. You know, I, that's that's how I am. Like if there's a movie I'm interested in or whatever, I'll listen to a podcast about it, whatever. But a lot of a lot of the ones you've done, like the older ones, I just completely never even heard of. I have no interest, so I just kind of skip those. Um, so <clears throat> if this episode had come out be, before Vito told me about it, I literally never heard of this movie. So had this been a different guest, this would have been one of the ones I'm skipping. <laughs> no, no question. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for listening and and critiquing. We really mean it. Please let us know if you have any thoughts on what we're talking about. But the reason why we're talking about this movie is because we're in the middle of our detective series right now. We've just, you've already listened to Zodiac and Fargo Fargo before that. And a, a big part of detectives is noir. Film noir, that's pretty much what it all is. And I don't know, to me, at least in, in my mind, and I think a lot of people's minds, the Big Sleep is kind of the the seminal film. I said it. Yeah, you did. The seminal film Check that for off your bingo cards. film noir. <laughs> um, 
it's it's the first one, right? Like, this is the biggest one. It's not the first one, but it's the biggest one. So many people talk about it, and so much alludes back to it. There's movies that, you know, we'll, we'll talk about nostalgia in a minute, but, like, I've seen since, and I haven't seen this since I was a very young person, and uh, I watched this again, I'm like, oh, forgotten every movie I've ever seen. The Maltese now. Falcon? Yeah, sure, the Which, Maltese Falcon. Or um, that's, that's a bad one that came out first, actually. What's, what's the Shit. one that... What's the one that we were going to do? L.A. Confidential? L.A. Confidential. There it is. L.A. Confidential. <laughs> That's the big sleep, man. Like, it's it's just all sorts of stuff. Harkens back to this. It's this messy movie that people kind of can't get away from or, or continue to go back to, which I think is really interesting because it's such a, a messy movie. I don't know. And to comment on what I was saying earlier, you know, like, The Man Who's Not Liberty Fan, that's one of the ones I'd never watched. And, oh like, I, I heard five minutes of it. I'm like, I'm actually going to have to watch this. <laughs> you know, because this sounds really dope. And I know I like to complain about the movies I've never heard of. But, like, just like this one, it's like, this is, I'm glad I watched this. I feel like I know a whole lot more and I'm going to watch more movies like it because you guys recommended it. So, it's like, I like to, you know, I'm talking my trash, but, like, Man Shot Liberty Fans was dope, and I, w- I never would have watched it and went back if it wasn't for you guys. So. Cool. Dude, I'm so glad you watched uh, it. That's credit awesome. there. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Great. Yeah, and I didn't mean to say, like, like I think that this is this is a seminal film. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it as many times as I can. Like, a lot of people haven't seen it. I didn't think I had seen this until, like, I watched it last week. And I was like, whoa, I've seen this movie before when I was, I don't know, seven yeah. I mean, questionable choice by the powers that be in thinking that you would want to see this or that it would be good for you to see. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm spoiling a future segment, but uh, yeah. not, not my bag. <laughs> yeah, we're walking all over future segments here. It's fun. <laughs> but I have a question for you guys. Sidebar question. Call it. Sidebar. This is the seminal. Oh. Yeah, there it is again. So, like, a lot of stuff has come out of this. But I wanted to ask, what are your guys' favorite detective movies other than The Big Sleep? Because that's everybody's favorite movie. Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> sir, I want to hear. You were the one that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you went on IMDb, you found some list of, like, top 100 private detective movies, and you're like, all right, I got a couple weeks to prepare. I'm going to watch all of these. <laughs> so out of those hundreds of movies, what's your favorite? So I literally did Google best detective movies and I tried to pick out a bunch I liked and I have seen a bunch of them, but really, I don't know. It's I'm picky. I like books better because books are able to give more detail and wrap it up better. Rewatch Girl with the Dragon Tattoo because I really like that. Again, I, like, I think I like the book better, but it's like I thought about this question and my final answer is actually not a movie. It's Sherlock. I think season season right. one and two, I don't yeah, remember, but yeah. the... Because season three and kind of went off the rails, but I, I like the type of detective that can see the things that everybody else sees, but like looks deeper into it and notices things people don't notice, and that gives breadcrumbs and you get to wrap it up at the end of the book. I like that kind of you know the detective, the big sleep type of detective. It's it's a different you know it's it's a private eye. It's you know he's going to the places, he's knocking on the doors, and he's gonna you know solve it through trial and error. Or, or effort or whatever but like you know the Sherlock is more like you know I noticed you had a, a bread club on your sleeve which means you had breakfast at this place and that means you were here but I'm being you know I, I like that <laughs> you know, I, li- I like that kind of detective so my answer would be you know Sherlock seasons one and two and definitely not three I think there was a four yeah, def- so definitely definitely awesome. not definitely not four for me that is mm, mm. No, four socks four socks yeah. three yeah. I think three is all right <laughs> Two, two and one are great. Yeah, that's a solid pick. Oh yeah, yeah one, one and two are like that's. If I if I if I want a detective movie or a show that I'm gonna sit down and watch and be excited about, that's definitely my, my preferred. Yeah, that's awesome. But that, Just, yeah, that is a that's a super pick. Yeah, now now I'm torn between Sherlock because I forgot that was even an option. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, Robert Downey Jr. is to be your next pick. <laughs> you know, I do really like the the Robert Downey. Sherlock. It was weird. It's yeah. out there. It has a totally different yeah. flavor than the Sherlock show does. But now, my favorite... We've already talked about my favorite one on this podcast, at least at the time of the release of this episode, which is Fargo. I think Fargo is another weird one because it's totally out there. I think it's an example of like the only really good detective that I've ever seen who also happens to be a pregnant woman. <laughs> this sort of character doesn't come up very often. And then the way that story plays out, it, it's so like the idealistic world meets like this dark, gruesome, wood chipper, murder type world. 
yeah, I've never seen anything quite like that, and I like the flow of that story. And it separates itself out from the pack of all the detective movies I've seen. Yeah. How about you, Vito? Those are those are both really good picks. I mean, as people know, I do really love Fargo, and I had also forgotten that the Sherlock season was was allowed because I kind of forgot about the show. When after season four came out, I was so excited to see it, and I, me and my wife sat down. My wife really liked it too. We sat down to watch it, and we were like, "What? What is this?" And then I think what happened, it made me not want to go back, and then I forgot. But it's it's a fantastic yeah. pick. But I'm gonna go with Inherent Vice as my favorite mm-hmm. private eye kind of movie because. It's funny, I, I hated that movie the first time I saw it. I hated it so, so much. And I'm a big fan of Paul Thomas Anderson. Me and my wife, when it came out, we went to a 70-millimeter screening of it at the Arclight in Hollywood. That's so cool. Yeah, it was great. And we're driving away from it. And we, we worked in this long drive, you know, back from L.A. We were going down what happened <laughs> in the movie and, like, trying to make sense of it minute to minute. Actually, one of the best memories I have seeing movies with my wife was this like two hour long car ride where we just talked intensely about this movie. And at the end of it, we were like, wow, I I think we figured it out. Like it makes sense now. (laughs) And it's funny. I've seen it a couple times now. It's, it's such a bizarre movie, but it's doing the same thing that the big sleep is doing. It has this sort of like downtrodden gumshoe who gets kicked every which way he turns. And there's this whole mess of things happening around him. There's all these characters who have all these motivations and you don't know what's happening really minute to minute unless you really care. And that's how I kind of felt about The Big Sleep. But I'm, I'm picking Inherent Vice. It's something that, that really touched me and I think about a lot, even though maybe its content is far more objectionable <laughs> than a lot of other movies. Yeah, it's, it's just my favorite. It's something that I think about often. What, what about you, Mike? It's cool. Um, so I, I love the movies that we're doing. Um, I think that they're all really, really fantastic. I don't know. I don't really do favorites. Um, I have sort of series of favorites, to be honest. But I was like going through this. I was like, I don't know. What's my favorite detective movie? And the things that came to mind were The Departed, which is not really a detective movie. Ain't no one a detective in that. It's kind of a... He's an undercover cop. Like he that's that, a detective. No that one figures so out different. anything, yeah. and they all die. <laughs> I, okay, I'm telling. I'm just telling you what came to my mind. The Fugitive came to my mind, which is also not really a detective. The Man movie. on the Run. It's kind of a detective yeah. movie. Are you just naming mystery movies? <laughs> I, I am. I am. Donnie Brasco, which that's is not a also movie. kind of a detective. He's an undercover cop. No, it's all Ooh, like under- Donnie's not. One of them is. I don't know. <laughs> No, but then I was like, okay, what's the best What's the best one that I've seen recently that isn't one of these ones and the one that I came up with was Insomnia. Oh. Insomnia by Chris oh. Nolan. Christopher Nolan. Nolan, that is a detective movie. It's very different. It's a bit of a deconstruction, I think, in a way. It has Al Pacino as a detective and Robin Williams in a fantastic oh, his best role. role. It's so good. Except I don't know if it's his best. Photo, but, yeah. Except for one hour photo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That, you, 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 you had a better joke than I did, man. <laughs> uh, and Hilary Swank as well. Um, and it's just, it's just so tense. The movie is so tense. And I also realized, as I was like, oh, it's Insomnia. It was originally made in Danish. It was a Danish film called Insomnia as well, which I haven't seen. But it stars one of our favorite actors, the dad actor of yep. dad actors. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Stellan Skarsgård. It's Stellan Skarsgård. It's Stellan Gar- Skarsgård. He's in, he's in everything. He's going to be in every episode some way or another. He's our guy. He's the new Kevin Bacon. It's like the six degrees of Stellan Skarsgård. Yeah, this is like two degrees of Stellan Skarsgård. Or his kids, because he's a dad and he has a kids. Lot of you know, it's, it's really I, strange. I hadn't even heard of this guy before I started doing this podcast, and now I hear his name in almost every episode that we do, because somehow he's always related to our movies. Every week, Bootstrap Bill <laughs> He haunts us all, Vito. He, haunts yeah, he us cheated all. with Marvel, so that six degrees of separation is just, just gonna be too, it's gonna be over too quick. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody within Marvel, and then you got his sons to act, and so it's like, yeah, it's, well, it's gonna over. Be super easy. Well, but I mean, he's in. See, the thing is, he's in everything. People just call him up and like, hey, you want to be in this? He's like, sure, I'm, I'm in it. So even without Marvel, like you can connect him to to everything. Which is which is cool. He's a yeah. cool dude. I like the guy. Yeah, I think it's clear. I like the guy. I think I think, I think so. it is. That's cool. I also just want to point out that uh, Insomnia is a movie we forgot to shout out last January when we recorded The Little Things, because The Little Things oh, yeah. is basically like the same movie as Insomnia, except The Little Things is way worse than Insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. Oh, there there's also no Insomnia. Is you know. Yeah. 
Well, you got the sense that he has some sleeping problems. I, I, I'm surprised that no one here said the little things. Was there? <laughs> <laughs> what? What? It, I, I thought that was too obvious. You know, It'd be everybody's first choice. I went first, so I assume y'all would pick it. You know, my bad. Mm-hmm. Should have picked awesome. it up along the way. That's awesome. Hey, fun fact about the little things: Jared Leto's in it. And uh-huh. I don't know if you guys knew that, but uh, Jared Leto's the lead singer of 30 Seconds to Mars. <laughs> I, just, I, just wanted, I wanted you guys to know that. You know, it blew my mind. It was kind of a big deal for me. I'm, I'm still processing it, but, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't want to pass this by without bringing that up. If, it, if anyone wants to go to Twitter, they can actively watch <laughs> Sir process this across his timeline. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So how long has he been the lead singer of 30 Seconds to Mars? Uh, since it existed. <laughs> and how just long has he been job? an actor? A famous no, he, actor? Longer. He acted longer. Yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah. But both he's of these have been going on for a long time. The, yeah. Right. More than 15 years. See, okay, yeah. okay. But I didn't know. <laughs> see, don't. I think I see what you're doing. Okay. I see what you're doing. <laughs> You know, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm 33 as of a couple of days ago. So I, I grew up with the 30 seconds from Mars in high school. Like that was something I listened to, but I don't know. I don't know how it's just, you know, just completely. I, I worked in a skating ring, so I listened to the music all the time. It just, I was listening to Vito and he was talking about, yeah, you know, and I like him, you know, being in 30 seconds from Mars. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I had to stop the episode. I Googled it. I was like, and I just, you know, I had to, I had to take, I literally took a moment like, well, I had to sit back and like. You know, it's like it's when, you, when your world shakes, you know, you just, I don't know. It, it, it's literally just an actor and just a band. But that moment kind of was like, this is a big, I don't know. <laughs> this is a big deal in my life right now. It's like, you know, I'm going to remember this moment, you know, because I look back and, you know, what? How did I not know that? You know, what life is weird. But yeah, it's like you got married, you had a kid, you found out that Jared Leto is the, the singer is the same as the actor. You had your second kids. That that's like yeah. that's like the order of life events. And like, the I think the week before I listened to that episode was the first time I ever watched Over the Hotel. What's the the signing? Oh, yeah. Oh. So yeah, the week before that's the first time I watched the signing. And then I go watch the uh, the kill video, and I'm like, I'm just sitting there, like it all it all comes together. <laughs> everything, everything makes sense, you know. They're in the Overlook Hotel, and that's Jared Leto, and what is going on right now? Yeah, so it, it was it was a moment for me. So just you know, listeners, you're welcome. Somebody out there just got their mind blown, and that's you know, and I'm passing that along to you. So you're welcome. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. Oh my gosh. You maybe listen to Kings and Queens, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. it's an excellent song. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't if you're following us on Twitter like he would I would set him up as best I could just to be able to drop a 30 seconds tomorrow's line in there because it was just I was listening to it all day every day and it's like I had all the songs so I'm like I would make it I would try to set them up to say something about something about King or you know just <laughs> any way for me to shove a 30 seconds tomorrow's <laughs> line in there so I think I'm, I'm feeling better now you know I'm calmed down I've kind of you know I'm, I've processed but I was I was having a moment for a while there you know <laughs> It's awesome. Wow. That's, awesome. that's really intense. We changed lives in this show, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we changed lives. This is amazing. Uh, so, speaking of changing lives, let's uh, let's move to the nostalgia. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. We're doing a show. Shit. We're doing a show. This is a lot of fun. So, yeah, let's move on to nostalgia and first impressions. So, uh, Vito, do you want to start? How, what's sure. your nostalgia? Like, did you see this movie ever before? Are you? Nope. Nope. This is first time for me, which is actually kind of nice. We don't often get that on the show, and it's kind of nice that it's the first time. I've not read the book. I've read Raven Chandler. Uh, I've read a lot of, like, Dashiell Hammett. I've read a lot of noir. I've seen a lot of noir. I've seen Maltese Falcon. But for some reason, The Big Sleep, I, I just never got to it. I don't yeah. know. So this is my first time. First impression, yeah, it's super confusing. <laughs> it's dense and impenetrable in a way that even Inherent Vice is not. That at least is very stylish, and there's like changes up the camera. There's like a deep emotional core to that story, and this one, it's it's a true noir, man. You are on the outside, kind of looking in. There's there's not the the voiceover to help you along. You just have to figure out these clues as he figures them out. And if you don't, like bye bye sucker, you're gonna be lost now, <laughs> yeah. including a, a part where they apparently took out a scene at the end where Bogey explains literally everything and what every clue was and how he got to this point. You're like nah. You don't need that. <laughs> this is a very frustrating watch for me. Very frustrating. I watched nice. it uh, one and a half times. I watched a bunch of commentaries on it. I've read interviews. I've done a lot of work for this episode, but I still am not entirely sure what happened. I do like it, quote unquote, I suppose. 
I suppose I, I respect it. I respect okay. it for yeah. where it stands in history. But after more time with it, I'm kind of like, man, I, I don't really know what to think of this movie. I don't even know how I would try and if it was in that time, right? It's 1946. I, I'm a young hotshot reporter getting to start writing writing art criticism like they still do now, and I have to go to the showing and I have to put out like 500 words for the next day. I don't even know what I would say. I'm like <laughs> super confusing, bro. Like, <laughs> real tough, <laughs> tough beat. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm sitting with my first impressions. Okay, I, I, I am still lost. Yeah. Still lost. You and Faulkner both, man. You're in good company. Yeah. Well, he was lost his whole adult life. Yeah. I, I, I strive for more direction than that. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, what about you? As far as nostalgia, I mean, maybe for this era, for this, you know, for this type of movie, watching this made me really miss watching this type of movie because, you know, so many movies out there, I don't really watch older stuff all too often, but... You know, watching something like this really made me appreciate, you know, the type of stuff that's out there and stuff that I've missed out on because I've been focusing on the the newer stuff. But, yeah, I mean, as far as my thoughts on the movie, it's I'm the type of person that likes to read the book first. So I have the context going into it. And Raymond, this is he's a really good writer. So I'm laughing out loud at the writing. I'm like, you know, the way he twists words, I'm like I'm reading the book like this is. I understand why they made this into a movie because he's a really good writer. This is a really good book. And then I watched the movie and I'm like, people can't understand what happened watching this movie. So I, I guess th- there's a piece of me that's wondering how this became so big and how it is remembered, how it's remembered because there's so many pieces missing from the movie that are in the book that I'm like, how did people enjoy this? You know, so, but I, I did think it's a, it's an enjoyable movie. I liked it, but the whole time I'm watching, I can't help but compare it to the to the book. Dude, that's awesome. I I am also like a read the book first sort of guy, mm. as well. So that's cool. I, I I thought the novel was very very good. I have like an I have an answer, but I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna save my answer for your question mm. for a little bit. When we move into themes, when, themes. When, oh, oh, but that that's when you're gonna that, talk. That's when, themes. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about that. Mike likes talking Je- about themes. <laughs> talk about themes. Okay, Jesse, <laughs> why don't you go? Well, I also hadn't seen this movie before, which makes oh me wonder gosh, why on earth we're doing Like, I know I've... Mike gave a whole defense of why we're doing this movie, but now I really don't understand yeah. why we're doing it. I thought somebody here had seen this movie before, but no, all four of us are just walking in blind to this grand classic. It, it was Mike? This was Mike's call? Well, I, this was my movie. This was my call of these four movies, or five movies, or however many we're doing in Detective Series. I did not think I had seen this movie. I assumed that Vito had seen this movie. I had I actually said seen, I'd, this movie. I'd seen this movie. I I know you did. I assumed it. Oh, um, okay. Because I assume that about Thank you. movies. Well, that's nice of you. Um, but no, I actually did see this movie. But but I don't want to okay. step on. Do you have more first uh, impressions, or also you're befuddled, bemused, and lost? I'm, I'm definitely befuddled. Definitely bemused. I have. N- I don't know. I don't know what this movie was. It just it just hit me like a train. It just kind of came, and it comes very like suddenly with Bogart entering a house, and then that that girl. I think her name is Cameron. Carmen. 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 No, it's Cameron. Carmen. Yeah. She clearly has a man. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron comes down the stairs. <laughs> so Carmen go, comes down the stairs and instantly starts flirting with them and falls in his arms and then he goes and talks to her dad who like wants to watch him drink in front of him and is saying like he wants to investigate a money order for Carmen. She's being blackmailed. Yeah, she's being blackmailed and then he goes and talks oh, to Carmen's yeah. sister and then he goes to an other place. I think it was a library and then he asked for some first editions and he goes to the librarian the librarian and him start hitting it off. Like, well, I don't know what this movie is. I'm like, all that stuff just came out of nowhere <laughs> and it's like, immediately, I don't know what we're doing and why. And the movie just keeps on going and there's a few times where it stops. The movie stops and Humphrey Bogart explains where he is and why he's there. This happens in two distinct moments. Once at the end and then once in the middle. And still I'm like, man, I still don't know how we're here. Like, somehow we're driving hours away for, for like, a poker gambling night? And then there's another there's another disappearance with the old dad's ex-private eye. 
and that happens to be the core of the real mystery, and then there's a murder that happens, and Carmen is there. I don't know what this movie is about, but every like step of the way, I'm like, man, Humphrey Bogart is making the right call here. Like, <laughs> you trust him completely. <laughs> he's so confident. I don't know what he's doing, but like, damn, he knows. He knows what he's doing. Oh, shit. That's a, okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like, I'm on his side. Like, dude, I think he's making the right call. Like, he just heard gunshots in the house. I would run in there too. You know. I, I think I think he's doing the right thing. And yeah, there's a little bit of a mystery. You're a private eye. I see why you're going over there. The movie doesn't make sense, but following it, if you just stop trying to pay attention to the mystery and just like pay attention to what Bogart is doing on screen at every moment, it becomes really funny. Like he's just delivering the best lines with the best quips oh at gosh, all moments. Yeah. And then I didn't I think I was trying to, like, absorb the mood because, like, oh, this is noir film. This is going to be, like, really serious at first. So I thought they were trying to be really serious at the beginning with, like, Carmen flirting with him. But I just realized that's supposed to be really funny. Like, that's actually, like, a comical yeah, scene. Yeah. That's not supposed to be a whole serious thing. When I realized that, like, halfway through the movie, I was like, oh, this is actually a comedy. This is all supposed to be really funny. It became super funny. Totally changed my viewing of it. But, yeah. I'd never seen it, and that was my viewing impression. I guess I should have done a whole Instagram story on that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. So, I mean, like, I guess, so you went in with, like, expectations of, a, of like, a dark, serious sort of murder mystery well, thriller. Yeah. Kind of like, kind of like maybe Fargo or Zodiac, like we've, we've looked at so far. But instead, this, this comes at you like it's a comedy at the beginning. It's... It's hilarious. Like, there's... Hol- it's, it's very right. funny. It's, yeah, it's very so funny. funny. Yeah. You know, she tried to sit on my lap when I was standing yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's got a lot of banter with the butler. I can't remember what it all was, but it was... I thought it was pretty funny at the time. Okay. So, I'm the only, only one with nostalgia. I actually do have nostalgia for this movie. I don't remember how old I was when I saw it. It might have been around 12. So, all I know is that all of, like, all of the innuendo went way over my head. Yeah. Whatever whatever age I was, I had no memory of this. But watching I was like, Oh, I've seen this movie. Like it comes on and like she tries to sit in his lap while he's standing up. I'm like, I remember that line. It's not just because I read the book a couple months ago. It's because I'd seen it. I'd seen all these people doing all of these things. I think it was actually when I was a, a kid we went to visit one of my aunts who lives in Virginia. Um and every night we watched these T C M movies. And I think this was on one of those nights, and that's Probably. when we watched it, uh, which is really cool. It's cool because it was with uh, my aunt and my uncle, great, wonderful, wonderful people. Do they listen um, to the show? They might, yeah. If uh, Martha, if you're out there, I love you. <laughs> I love you deeply. <laughs> Shout out to aunts, great. <laughs> Shout out to Aunt Martha. <laughs> I think, and tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you didn't show this to me. Uh, maybe it was someone else, but. <laughs> But whoever it was, if we hear was back, young. then we'll have to redo this. <laughs> yeah, then we'll have to redo this. Uh, so I feel like I was definitely given a um, one up by having read the book pretty recently, because everything I was like, oh, I know what's going on here. I know who this person is. I know who that person is. I know what they're doing. I remember it vaguely in the back of my mind because it's been a few months, which might be helpful. That might be an expectation to have going into this. Like read the book first, and you'll. Enjoy it more. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and everything's a whole lot clearer, and it's the meaning and like the ending is more impactful. And so it's like, if, yeah, if you're gonna watch this, if you want to appreciate it, read the book first. Because if not, you're gonna walk away like Jesse. Like, what, the, what, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I don't understand anything. <laughs> Wait. So Jesse, do you know who who did it? I do. I don't even know what somebody oh, there's did. There's so many it's. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. There's so no. many it's in this in this movie like, in your book. Uh, we're we're trying. <laughs> let's let's get through. We try to do like a spoiler free part at the beginning. This is an hour of spoiler free or something at this point. I don't know. Um, who knows? But let's try to get through it and then let's go into like try to figure out what this plot actually is. Maybe that's what we'll do in the in the second half of this. That's gonna but be so tough. so I want to ask a question. The first, and maybe we can just do that, like try to figure out what this plot is. But what I want to do first is ask the big question, or one of our two big questions. Will we show this to our kids and when? Sir, you go first. I think I might. I mean, my, my kid's only two now, so, yeah. you know. But this is, 
I really I really want to show him movies in this era because like even me, you know, by the time I'm growing up, this is an old, old era where I, I rarely see movies like this. So for him, you know, this is me plus 20 years. So I really uh, well, 30 years. Oh, sorry, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's 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 terrible to say it as it is. But the way movies are now, there aren't as many. Well, I don't know. I was about to say wholesome, but there's a bunch of dirty stuff in here too. So who can <laughs> say that? Or I, they don't show it. They they tell don't yeah, show here. Yeah, movies yeah. now show yeah, don't tell. Apparently yeah, that's mo- better. Yeah, movies now they, show a lot more. But yeah, I mean, so I, I do I do want to watch this era of movie and this kind of noir type movie. So you know, this and all the the older black and white type films where you know the vibe is different. You know. Uh, me being black, there there comes with a grain of salt watching anything like this because there are either no black people or black people are serving and stuff. So that's that's going to be part of the conversation. But still, just seeing movies in this era, I would want to show him and probably it, I wouldn't have to say even be too old. Maybe in the you know what you're talking about in the eight to ten range or something like that to where he's old enough to actually just kind of watch it and appreciate it and understand it. You know, and my. My collection is extensive, so I mean, we're going to watch a bunch, so, but yeah, I think somewhere around there, when you can actually appreciate what's going on, and just not, it's more than just the story, but it's the way the story is being told, and kind of the vibe of it, so I, I definitely want to show some movies in this era to them around that age. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I really connect with that. In fact, um, I actually tried to show this to my kids. I, I tried. It was so utterly boring for them that they just kind of, they couldn't take it. Because, like, I didn't know what was going on, so I'm sure they had no clue what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they had a better idea, and they were just like, this isn't worth paying attention to. Cause... <laughs> Clearly the butler did it. Why are we laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly the butler did it. Exactly. But, man, but I, I kind of had the same, same idea as sort of, like, I wanted to show my kids something you know, it's the forties. It can't be that bad. You know, if there's shooting or whatever, it happens in such a way that it's like, I don't know. It, it's, you know, in star Wars where you shoot people and you don't bleed. Well, that's what I'm okay with having my kids see. And the same thing kind of happens here. Yeah. You're not really seeing a whole lot of blood or gore or anything. So like, all right, no people are going to be shot. I think it'll be fine. I think, we'll, I think they'll go for it. They didn't go for it. They, it was just too boring for them. I don't even know what you have to have to watch this movie. Because, like, it's not, like, comprehension of a plot, because that doesn't help. I'm not sure if I'm ever really going to sit down and watch this movie with my kids, to be honest. Like, I I don't think I care about it that much. Like, I remember, I think, I think The Thin Man, does that ring any bells? Yeah, Yeah, I I remember watching that as, as a kid. I think The Thin Man has a bunch in there, too. I think it's more than one movie. Yeah. I think it's, like, the whole... There's, like, five of them, yeah. Okay. That, yeah. yeah that's so I remember okay. getting really into those because I was always like a straightforward murder mystery and who did it. And, you know, to be able to say things like it's the butler, I'm like I want my kids to have that. I want them to have a basis of murder mystery in their life. And I think going okay. back to these older black and white movies is, is the way to go for that. But I, I don't think it's here. I don't think it's for, with the big sleep, personally. Uh, I, I think I do want to show this to my kids. It's a mess. It's confusing, but I also feel like the 8 to 10 range. I almost feel like this movie is made, like, for me, specifically. (laughs) Like, I really like this movie a lot, partially because it's so convoluted and it never unravels. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter that you never get there. I I feel like it becomes more than what it was meant to be because of that. It almost becomes a chick flick. In the end, or like a guy's version of a chick flick. <laughs> it's fine. I, I kind of feel like finally this is a love story that's dressed up like a film noir. Um, well, he did say the woman wrote like a man. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a woman's version of a man's movie. <laughs> you know? It's subversive. Subversive. The original chick flick. Yeah. The, the big, big sleep. sleep. Yeah. That's, that's our hot take tonight. Yeah. The big sleep. The original chick flick. That's great. It's pretty hot. Vito, Vito is going to stab me. Now. I'm just, I'm, I'm along for it. <laughs> I know. I, this, I, I have a lot of love for this. I have a lot of love for the fact that things aren't really tied up at the end. There's questions still about who did what. It feels real. It feels like a real movie. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited 
to show it to them when they're like eight, nine, ten, something like that, mm-hmm. and then probably like not watch it again, and then they'll come back when they're you know thirty years old and they have a podcast of their own because <laughs> their dad got rich and famous with a podcast, so they were gonna try to. I mean, I mean, it's pretty bold. I mean, you're calling your yeah. shot. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be like, "Remember that movie that we watched? It didn't make any sense, but it's great." And I'll be like, "Yeah, exactly. There you go. Exactly, I win." <laughs> yeah. So exact. Basically, I'm I'm hoping for my children to have the exact same life that I did, uh, which is what we're supposed to. I hope do not. with our kids. <laughs> <laughs> for you, I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. What Wait, about you, Vito? Are you going to show this to? Sorry, to before Vito goes, oh, I yeah. do want to clarify one thing. I think part of the reason why I don't really want to show this to my kids, even in the eight or nine range, is because I think when they're eight or nine, they can start to get the quips and stuff like that. But then if we start talking about the quips in this movie, I really don't want to have to explain all the innuendos that are going on around there. That just leads to a really uncomfortable time. Like, I can't, I honestly can't imagine showing this to my kids when they're eight or nine. No, 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 son. The horse means sex. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh, you just fast forward past that part and get, like, like yeah, everything else is fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, the murder. But, I mean, I'm not one to talk. I did, I actually watched half of this with my daughter, uh, who, is, who is three and a half. She was very involved. She was, she really? was very confused. But she, she it actually kind of helped me on the second watch. Because she was asking so many questions that I did not have answers for. Because <laughs> the movie starts, Humphrey Bogart walks in. She says, is he a nice man? I say, I don't think so. She goes, okay. And then Carmen walks in. She goes, is she a nice lady? I said, I don't think so. And they're talking to each other. She says, why are they not very nice and why are they talking to each other? I said, I don't know. I don't know, kid. I really, I don't. We're starting at ground zero here. I am confused. She's talking to the old man. She's like, why is the not nice man talking to the nice old man? I said, again, you got me. I don't, I don't. No. <laughs> so it was kind of helpful because she was asking the questions that I, my adult brain had kind of turned off and like, oh, the movie will tell me. But she's just asking the honest questions that a, a very open viewer would ask when introduced to this world. And that was kind of helpful to me in kind of making up how I felt. So I would watch this with my daughter specifically so that I could tell her about when I watched it with her. Because <laughs> I, mean, I think that would be kind of fun. Oh, awesome. um, but as far as... As far as everything goes, if we're doing Bogart, yeah, we got to watch it if we're, if we're going to do the big Bogart ones. it's it, Like I said, I, I respect it more in its, for its place in film history than I do for its identity as a film. Yeah, so I think there's going to be some movie watching nights with Dad that are going to be more like homework, and this is going to be one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's but a I good would, point, too. Yeah. I would say, like, I don't know, whenever I feel like it. Like, I really I really am not going to really slap too hard of an age on it, because yeah. it could come along later when they're, like, 14, and that might actually be better. Because I remember hating yeah. old movies when I was a teenager, but then finding a couple that I really, really loved, and they influenced me like a lot, and they were really unexpected ones, and maybe this could be one of those. Ooh, wait. I don't know. A really big one was um, a, this movie M. Um, I think it oh, came out yeah. in, the, in the 30s, directed by, uh, uh, what's his name? I forget now. But it's, it's about a child murderer in Germany mm. who gets, uh, gets out kind of scot-free on a technicality. And so what happens is they, they brand him with a chalk mark on his jacket, a criminal uh, guy, remember the criminal underworld does. And now the cops and the criminals are working together to kill him, essentially, because of how heinous his crimes are. And it's really good. I just remember watching it being kind of in awe. And I had no business like watching this movie. It's super old. It stars, it stars like, I think Peter, Peter Lorre maybe? But it's a very strange movie, but it's really, really good. And that was one of the, that was one of those ones that I just randomly, I was buying Criterion discs when I was 15 and that was the first one I ever bought. And the second one was like the seventh seal, which is the other one that I really connected with. You were a weird, weird child. I had no friends. <laughs> that's so cool, though. Like, that's awesome. Yeah, this, I wish, I this wish is what I, happened. I wish I had bought Criterion. I bought, I bought CDs. I bought CDs. I also bought CDs. I bought Modest Mouse CDs. So. Nice. I bought Blink-182 and, and Green Day CDs. I bought those, too. American <laughs> Idiot, man. Yes. That was so Listen great. Listen to American Idiot a lot. And I was like, wow, I wish I could be like those white kids. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, okay. uh, no, I, I, that's that's what I attach myself to. And if my kids attach themselves to this, that'd be great. But of course, when they're 15 years old, when she's 15 years old in 12 years, then the 40s will be like the 70s. So I don't really want her getting into the 70s, the 60s, I guess. Still don't want her getting into the 60s. That's true. What? <laughs> I'm really confused about what you <laughs> If you're using the same time gap that I used when I was selecting movies, 
And oh. if they use that same time gap when they get to the age that I then was, then they'll be watching movies from the sixties. It'll, it'll and 70s. be like it'll be further up. Gotcha. And as we get further up in culture, it's gonna get like a lot rockier. I see what you mean. Yeah, they're gonna be like, "Have you heard of the Rocky Horror Picture Show?" Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you have. <laughs> But, like, we need to talk about the plot. We've talked about how it's so confusing and everything. Like, let's let's talk about why it's, like, not horrible. Because I feel like all it, all it feels all right, like all right. right now is that it's horrible. No! I, no. I, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, yeah. You know what, Mike? I want, I want to hear you. No, that's okay. Dude, you if you didn't like it, that's fine. What makes this movie something. Yeah. Or what makes this plot cohesive. Because I've heard people on these internet rants mention that it's somehow cohesive. And I don't get it. Uh, well, so, I mean, up to this point, we've kind of talked about stuff happening in the movie, but we haven't really talked about what this movie is. So, like, you're talking about having a non-spoiler and spoiler section. Do you want to just it. kind of, like, how do we... Yeah, uh, let's how, just yeah, launch into we, it. Yeah. So, so we're going to... Let, let's jump into this movie. Like, we've talked around it a bunch. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time talking about the people and the way we feel about it and, and everything, but... Guys, what is the Big Sleep? What? Why is it called the Big Sleep? First of all, I want to know that. If you if you've read the book, it's very obvious Ooh. because he says it. He says it over and over at the at the very end of the book. I mean, if we're if we're spoiling, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Rusty Regan, the um, oh. the ex husband that ran off, yeah. you know, part of the Bitch. initial private investigating isn't about him, but you know. Obviously, the the general of the movie always wondered what happened to him. So at the end of the movie and the book, you find out, well, more obviously in the book, but at the end, you find out that Carmen killed him. And basically, they, Philip Marlowe, the detective, instead of telling the general what happened, he's basically, but uh, he's saying it's better basically to let sleeping dogs lie and... You know, I'm not going to tell the general what happened. We're not going to dig up his body because at this point, it doesn't matter. He's sleeping. He's sleeping the big sleep. It doesn't matter to you know oil and I think I forgot how the phrasing is. Uh, oil and water or air and dirt. It's all the same to you because he's sleeping the big sleep. You know, he, basically he's dead. So, you know, digging him up and all that kind of stuff doesn't really matter at this point. He's dead. He's sleeping the big sleep. So that's that, that's where the name come from. Like the last two sentences of the book just come out and say he's sleeping the big sleep so i guess that's where the title come from but the whole ending of this movie is excised well from from none of the stuff at the end of this book is in the movie and they completely tweak it to where the thug gangster guy's name eddie mars Mars, yeah so in in the book he uh, he he covers up the crime and kind of helps her to figure out how to bury the body or whatever but he's not actually the killer so in the book, I mean, in the movie, you know, there's a big shootout and all that kind of stuff at the end. But in the book, he just kind of comes, picks up his wife and that's that. The book goes more into detail about how Carmen is really mentally disturbed. And like, we're going to, I mean, there's like a line thrown away in the movie about you need to ship her off and take her to get some help. But it's a bigger deal in the book. So yeah, like the calling it the big sleep, it doesn't really, like I said, as far as the movie, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because basically the theme or the core of what the book is about is kind of excised in the movie so that's another reason it just kind of the movie felt weird to me because you're missing out on all the juice that is the book yeah well yeah i I think that's that's true i do think it's there but it seemed to me i you said i I think the big sleep is specific whoa i don't know why whatever at least least we're not recording (laughs) yeah wait Uh, no jesse's gone jesse's gone and jesse is just gone just gone I know who's talking about the laptop was having issues. Maybe it died or something. The whole computer is not working. I mean, I mean, we we can continue. Is it is there a high likelihood of success that you're going to get the computer to unfreeze and that the Audacity file will be uncorrupted? God, I was I was really it. enjoying I was really enjoying like listening to, to that because then I was finding out what happened. <laughs> Maybe this is just like you know how like Macbeth, if you're acting in it, you got to call it the Scottish play. And like, oh, there's right. always like like bad shit that happens. Yeah. If you're doing Macbeth, like, usually the people who do it die or their career goes down the toilet or something. Yeah. Um, maybe with the big sleep, if you try to explain it, like everything goes wrong in your life. Because I think it's explainable. It's I mean, yeah, no, it definitely is. It right? for sure is in the book. <laughs> well, I think they have everything there. 
Like, they have the explanation for just about everything. No one, except for who killed the driver. Okay, right. everyone they, says... There's an implication of who killed him, mm-hmm. but it's not that clear, right? Yeah. He killed himself. How would he kill himself? Suicide. No, in the book, he killed himself, not in the movie. Yeah. In the movie, in the movie, oh. he gets sapped. Yeah. But they don't know. One guy confesses to sapping him, but said he didn't kill him. Joe, yeah, so Joe Brody. He, yeah. Yeah, so he... I mean, because, yeah, the way in the book, Joe Brody hits him or whatever, and then he drives off, and, you know, he just killed the other guy. So I just assume it was the same way in the movie to where he just, you know, drove, drove off the bridge. Yeah. Because uh, the, all the police did say that, you know, it was wet when he did it, or just whatever the clues say that it was probably suicide. So I just I ran with it. Because he, he wasn't shot or nothing, and he did just kill a guy. So I assume he just drove off the bridge. It's like, I'm screwed. That's fair. How, 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 how much this? more should we describe before we have to repeat it again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be like, all right, we, we solved it. We figured it out. And Jesse's back. So let's just Wait. pretend we don't understand. You did know? you, did, I, without explaining it, let's not explain it because you and I both know what happened. Have you, um, a great movie that I love a lot that I'm like digging myself into a hole with this one. I, have, I haven't seen it in several years, but oh, I loved it. we can talk about that movie. I loved it when I saw it. If, I don't know, five years ago or seven years ago or something, with Jared Leto is uh, Mr. Nobody. Have you seen that movie? Uh, It's a weird movie. It made me think of, the only thing I can think of that's like it is kind of Big Fish, but it's very different from Big Fish. Um, (laughs) It's kind of like it. (laughs) There's like a weird fairy tale-y vibe that's both like sort of bubbly and also sad. There's a lot of sadness in it, uh, but it's I'm also to, scary. Right <laughs> yeah, that's some because I just watched um, Trance the other day because yeah, the 2013 movie yeah with, with Rosario uh, and McAvoy, yeah, directed yeah, by Danny Boyle. Like, I didn't see Trance because I, oh because I was looking at detective movies and it came up. I don't know why after watching it, but the <laughs> the plot premise was like you know it was really interesting about. Uh, him being a part of a bank robbery. So I said, oh, I don't even want to finish reading. I want to watch this. And it was garbage. Uh, <laughs> it's Vincent Cassell. Uh, Jesse says, continue. He is recovering. And yeah, he says, just finish it. He's recovering? He's recovering the episode. He's... And also, he's probably was... crying a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he can save it. It is going to work. He says that he's working on it. Okay. I know. <laughs> so we're gonna finish this up and then he's gonna be like uh it couldn't didn't get it it's corrupted and sorry man i want him to be here though too like well he can't i know i know it sucks <sighs> have you seen fargo and zodiac uh recently um, or at all yeah i've seen both of them okay yeah okay zodiac was i don't know boring as shit but <laughs> that. that's one of my favorite right. movies dude all right all right Okay, so where were we? So hopefully this isn't for nothing, but let's get it. We were talking a bit about the big sleep, why it's called the big sleep. Uh, Rusty. Yeah. Yeah, so plot of the book for, you know, those that are listening and kind of haven't figured it out by now. Private investigator goes to investigate. Um, yeah, the karma is blackmailed left and right. but So one book, quote unquote, bookmaker or book bookstore salesman or whatever is blackmailing karma and he wants to figure out you know what's that about so he goes is that tracks him down is that geiger he's murdered yeah that's yeah, geiger that's geiger yeah okay. geiger yeah. geiger yeah geiger's murdered he tries to figure out who killed geiger yeah I, i'm sorry i was trying to recap like, <laughs> it's, five, so, five it's so hard to book. recap yeah so many people get murdered. wait okay but... can, can i give it a shot sure i'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna try it i'm gonna try okay. my hand at this okay. it might be a mess if it is, that's what they want anyway, right? <laughs> Faulkner will be proud if I do. That's what I. That's my goal. So, private eye named Philip Marlowe, he uh, he gets hired by this old general who has two crazy daughters. And he's getting blackmailed because of one of them. Crazy hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and crazy, crazy. Yeah. That, that too. Yeah. And uh, one of them, the younger one of them, is getting blackmailed by a guy named Geiger, who is ostensibly a bookseller. Phil Marlowe goes to pay a visit to the bookseller. He meets a lady at the bookstore across the street who thinks that he is a beautiful man. (laughs) It rains. He leaves. He discovers where... Follows Geiger to his home, 
where he sees the younger of the two sisters leave for car. Shit, I'm getting lost in the in the. Yeah, you just jump. You just jumped when he's dead, right? It happens within the first twenty right. minutes. Oh, that's right. right this right, is right. the first twenty minutes of the film. Yeah. So he he, he follows he, Geiger to his home. Carmen is also at his home. The younger of the two sisters gets out. She goes into the house. They're there, and then Marlo hears gunshots. He runs in and discovers Carmen in a compromising situation. There's a camera taking pictures, and Geiger has been shot and is dead on the ground. That is the opening bit of the movie. And by the way, Chekhov's rental house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it totally comes back. Yeah, it comes, it totally back. comes, it back. comes back. If you see a. If you see a it in the first act, house. it's got to come back yeah. in the third act. Yeah. The damn house comes back. Yeah, yeah. the damn house. Comes, it's there's going to be something in every movie. <laughs> yeah, like that. no, there or is. Or it's also like the hero's journey, returning home. Yes, in air quotes. Yes, yes, yes. There we go. And then, so then, okay. Yeah. So then he takes her back, and then he's already had the conversation with Lauren Bacall, and then he's like, "She'll be fine in the morning. Take care of her." And then he leaves there, and now I've completely lost the movie. <laughs> I got that part. I, I got that scene. <laughs> yeah. What happens, what happens next? next? What What even? A bunch of like. Then he gets a call about the um, the car being in the water. He goes and right. finds oh, out yeah. that the driver, you know, the the general's driver's in the water. He's dead. Uh, then calls Vivian. You know what? I don't know if this is really that valuable. Like going through <laughs> the plot line by I'm line. Just a really it's a, hard it's time a messy thing. plot. It's yeah. really complicated. Yeah. And there. So all all, yeah. the, all the people killed. The driver of the car. He's killed. The bookmaker Geiger, he's killed. And, and to be Brody. clear, he, he's a pornographer. He's not a he's Correct. not a bookmaker. Yeah, he's okay. he's hiding he's behind a secret pornographer, yeah, yeah, hiding behind the front of a, a bookstore to sell to to rich yeah. people. Back back when that was the thing you had to do. Yeah. yeah. Now you can pour into everywhere now. But yeah, so Brody, he's killed. Rusty Regan, he's killed. And he, his name, I, whose name is Sean in the movie version of it his name is sean Regan oh, in the movie. Yeah. yeah i know it's weird i don't know why they changed it yeah. i guess sean sounds more irish yeah i thought there were and i thought there were five who's oh yeah and then um at the end oh the harry Hitman jones guy. no harry jones harry Remember? jones the harry sad, jones, the sad, the sad, the sad guy yeah, so that's that's six murders yeah. <laughs> yeah harry jones dies and then can you uh, know he dies yeah that's six and murders in one movie eddie mars in just a great payoff and then oh, you, the true. movie ends oh, you're like yeah. Am I really happy that Eddie Mars is dead? I don't know. I kind of like, liked Did he Eddie. do anything? I thought he was kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. And that, it just, it was the silliest, I don't know, it didn't really make sense to me in the movie, because he's like, as soon as you open that door, they're going to shoot whoever walks out. I was like, I don't know if 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 I if you open the door and I see you're my boss, you know, maybe I hesitate a second before shooting. Maybe they hate so that guy. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I thought you were the other guy. I just oh, continued I shooting. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I don't. Yeah, trying to to, to recap it, it's difficult because there's the ins and outs and going back to the first place and like I said, the, just trying to figure out who killed who is a is kind of a mess. So doing that in the movie that takes a chunk out i mean it's hard to recap but i think it's more about following along the detective journey trying to figure out who done it you know? yeah yeah well i think even high level though it, it makes a little more sense than when you get into it because it's like basically philip marlowe gets hired to figure out who's blackmailing carmen sternwood the younger the younger sternwood figures it out it's Geiger and trying to figure out how to get him off the case like what what's what's he blackmailing her for and how to get him out of the picture like how to pay him off or, or what to do here he figures that out and halfway through the movie that case is solved but you've figured out that there's this underlying issue that's going on and he's figured it out with the disappearance of this guy sean regan who is spoken about all the time throughout the movie but never makes an appearance because we find out in the very end he's dead mm -hmm. and so he's become interested in the sternwood family particularly vivian sternwood and so he wants to figure out what this dark secret she's got buried is. And so he kind of goes on his own without really getting the say-so from the, his, the guy who hired him. And with uh, many people actually telling him not to do it, to figure out what happened to Sean Regan. What's going on here? What do they have? What's the bigger thing that they have on Carmen and Vivian Sternwood, the two sisters. And I think kinda, I think that's kind of the opposite in the book because he 
isn't investigating Regan at all. He's trying to figure out the blackmail, but everybody thinks he's in, uh, investigating Regan. So every time somebody says, you're trying to find out who Regan is, he's like, no, I'm really not, but not, give me the information you got, because, I don't know, I feel like we're kind of, we're kind of butchering the story, but uh, it's very interesting, and, you know, I really enjoyed the, the P.I. aspect of it. I like those kinds of um, movies, and I did watch The Long Good Night yesterday, because you oh, recommended cool. it, and it didn't care for nope. it. <laughs> I, I also, yeah. I, was, I was very carefully wording it. It's, there's a lot of things you can say about it. There's a lot of stuff you can yeah. talk about, it, a lot of stuff it influence, but as a movie, I remember watching it and being like, also like, I just think I like reading yeah. these things. I don't think I like yeah. watching them. Interesting. Because it's, it's also very confusing. It's very long. Yeah, it's very boring. Quite unnecessarily horny as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> The, they're like naked uh, yoga girls next door. They're naked half the time, and the camera just always pans to yep. and it doesn't end up being anything. They're not a part of the story nope. at all. It's just every now and then the camera's like, hey, don't forget about those naked girls next door. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. That was the 70s, right? The, there's a it scene is. with dogs humping for no yep. reason, and so it's like, yeah, it's like yeah. I remember watching yeah. it and going, like, people speak in such vaulted terms about this movie. It makes me wonder if they saw it. It's super important because a lot of important people have said it's important and they've allowed it to influence their work. And that's kind of it. That's kind of the only reason why. And I don't feel as harshly towards this movie as I do towards that movie. I think that this movie is is just very confusing and possibly the, the pieces that are needed to make it completely coherent are not here. And maybe you can sort of Frankenstein your way into explaining the plot of the movie itself. I do think there's just some very important pieces that aren't all the way here. And it would have been better if they had been here. Yeah. I, I don't want to take yeah. away from your love yeah, for this. No, 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 that, that's, that's okay. what I clearly see is happening with this. Yeah. It's at least fun, which yes. the long goodbye is not fun. I did oh, not have okay. fun. Just yeah, just watching this when uh, Vivian's in Marlo's office and like she's going to call the police and then they have oh, a yeah. whole banter about pretending that's not funny. to be the police and it's like that's not in the book at all and it adds nothing but oh i love that to, scene yeah. that was hilarious yeah. it's just it's just the charisma yeah. of the actors you know that's all that's it all was it so is. great to in like the way she's like trying to like itch her knee and like back yeah. then you know you can't show your thigh or whatever and he's like just itch it like, <laughs> fine you know it's, it's, it's cute it's fun it's yeah. I, I love that scene man yeah this is definitely like the path of the book and the path of the story as a whole. It goes from being kind of like warm and fun and like they're finding it out and figuring it out to being like dark. Yeah. Toward like halfway through. I was actually timing it. I watched it again. And halfway through is when Joe Brody gets shot by the kid. Yeah. And at that moment, the movie gets like way darker. It starts being night all the time. Yeah. I think it's night from that moment on. Before that, it was primarily day. We had a lot of fun witticisms. Yeah. But from that moment on, it gets super dark. Yeah. I was kind of thinking, like, maybe this is the point where, where Lay st stopped writing and Faulkner started writing. They, they, they did say that <laughs> Faulkner did the, the second half. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what it seems like. It definitely seems like a dark sort of... And I was thinking, too, maybe that's why, like, the plot doesn't really cohere. So this there's this big sort of... It's not really important to the plot, but an important plot point about why that guy kills Joe Brody in the book and do you understand what that kid's relationship was to geiger from the movie these are the two people who when he's in the bookstore <laughs> the door opens and they're packing up the stuff yeah and then the door closes yeah and then it turns out that the young the young fresh-faced guy killed the older guy and we find the older guy on no, the no, floor. no 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 he didn't kill that guy okay yeah see so so in the book, you find out that that young, fresh face he the the fresh face kid yeah. is the one who killed Joe Brody. Okay, at the apartment, which is a fun scene right. until like Joe Brody gets killed, right. which it is in the book. It's like shocking that it happens. Oh, oh, when he opens the door and gets shot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But then, do do you know like did you think that he had killed Geiger? K kinda. Yeah, I did too when I was like twelve or whatever yeah. before I read the book. In the book, it becomes clear they're lovers. He and Geiger are lovers. Okay. And so he removes the body. So, it, like, he has this weird relationship. Oh, that's where, why the body left. That's why the body, he left it because he was, like, they were lovers, but he also sort of worshipped him. It was very weird. I don't know if back then, like, they would have picked up on that watching the movie. I mean, I, sure I would tell didn't pick it up now. I would never have, what? I did not pick it up in the movie. Right? D did you remember yeah. that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I read the book, you know, a day before. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he. Um, basically, he was living there. You know, he was his gay lover, so he moved the body that way. The police wouldn't come. They give him time to clean out his room and pretend he didn't live there. Okay. And then he came back because he felt bad that he just moved his body and left it in the garage. He's like, you know, this was my lover or whatever I can't leave him like this so he put him in the bed and crossed his arms and made it all pretty or whatever so and lit all the candles all that was and... yeah all that was excised from the from the movie but I don't know if it necessarily needed to be there either it just it just made everything messier you know it, it, so. like but actually I would have liked to have connected with somebody I, whenever I hear the name Carmen I just think Santiago uh, <laughs> but um, no what's the last name of the, the wait wait, the wait, wait wait Santiago yeah Brooklyn Nine-Nine yeah Oh, yeah. I'm 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 older. I think Carmen San Diego. I also do. Nice. Yeah. So I was. Just, oh, maybe that's where it came from. San Diego. It probably San Diego. is. Yeah. Oh, okay. We've been binge watching that. It's so great. funny. But wait, no. Back, back, <laughs> back, back. What is the family? Focus, focus. What is the family name of the old guy? We've been saying it this whole time. I just blanked. Geiger. Uh, no, no. The Joe main, Brody. No, the main guy Sternwood. that hires him. General Thank Sternwood. You. Sternwood. Sternwood. Colonel or general? General. It's a general. general. There's three Sternwoods. I don't care for any of them very much. Oh yeah. And then we have Marlowe, who's fine. He's not a nice man. He's quite cruel, in fact. But he's engaging to watch, right? Yeah. And then I don't. I don't have any feelings towards. And I have no emotional relationship to any character here, except for the poor dude who has to drink the poison. Yeah, right. I liked that guy. I felt bad for that guy. And when he died, I was like, wow, that's a that's a damn tragedy. I that's, hated it. Yeah. That, dude, you're Philip Marlowe. Good. Like, like, that's who you are. <laughs> Yay! Because, like, I, I was... I win <laughs> or lose. No, Come after I watched both. it the second time, I was like, it's wild. So he's just like this, he's kind of like slouchy and sitting back the whole movie until that guy gets killed. Yeah. And then he is angry. And the reason why Gets Mars killed has yeah. nothing to do with, like, his own personal safety. I mean, it's partially his own bit. personal safety and getting vengeance. But it's because he killed Jonesy. Jonesy, that's the kid's Jonesy. name. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was kind of fascinating to see that. Did you feel for Jonesy? Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh, in yeah. the movie, in the book, it it was better yeah. because he following him around. He was tailing him, and like uh, Marlo, like walked around the block and snuck up to his window, and like, why are you following me? Blah blah blah. There was none of that, like beating him up. Like he in the movie, he just randomly got beat up, and then. Harry randomly walks up to him and it's like, hey, are you the guy that's been following me? It's like, the, those breadcrumbs weren't really laid well in the movie. It was, it, it was more impactful in the book. So I, I have the book upstairs on my shelf because I have one of those nice, like, Library of, of America editions where it's like mm. seven novels in one, but the paper is like so thin that if you sneeze, it'll explode. Uh, so <laughs> I, I have it up there and I've been wanting to read it, but I haven't read it because again, the paper is so thin. But I think I just, I need to try because from everything you guys are saying, the story that I'm interested in is in, is in the book. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, 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 and, and as I, we talk through it, I'm like, you know what? That, that, book, that book was way better than the movie. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel bad about that because I feel like I, I'd be better at discussing this movie had I not read the book, but I can't help but, you know, compare the movie to all the things that were better in the book. And this episode isn't about the book, you know, it's about the movie, but I can't help but saying, yeah, this is this, but it was better in the book because it explained this and explained that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I usually hate that kind of criticism about better in the book, except for in a case like this, where it seems like the movie is almost incomprehensible without the book. Yeah. And I say almost because you're you're right. You can find a lot of the stuff. You you can figure out the stuff that's important. I I understand the movie because I read the book. Like like okay. that scene. That's the middle scene of the movie. It's where uh, Brackett and Faulkner. Brackett and Faulkner like split, and they probably were both like, "Oh, he wrote that really awkward part," and he was like, "She probably wrote that really awkward yeah, part," yeah. <laughs> and no one wrote it. Like no one, no one figured out how to write it. In Firthman did it. <laughs> Firthman's like he he he. <laughs> well, he was just like, uh, okay, here you go. I don't want to write it, so no one wrote it, and no one, no one looked into it, which connected. It's like this kind of tying moment for the whole story. I think. Yeah, there is one thing that I really do like about this movie. Like this, clearly the plot is a mess. I think we've said that a bunch of times, but I do want to say like. What I do like about this movie a lot is the fact that it goes from being a true, a full-on detective movie um, to being really a story about falling in love. And it's not necessarily good at that, 
I, I don't know. I think that this I had is fun true. with it in that way. It, it's fun. Yeah. Right. Like if yeah. I was always confused, but I was always fun. I was always like I was always like this movie's this it's moving. We're doing stuff. Yeah. This is a scene. This is a good scene. Oh, it's another good scene. And each time you get back to Marlo and Vivian together, their relationship has has evolved in a way. Yeah. And it's that is done very well. I think that that relationship has evolved, and they're coming at each other. They're sparring, but by the second time they meet, they're both like, we like each other. Yeah. Like, we get along well. We both look at the world in the same way. It made me think a little bit about, like, what? why do we even like noir? Like, what is it about it that we like? I think it's kind of this idea of the fact that you've got this guy who's, who's you know, he's alone in the world or whatever, but they tend to find someone, I don't know, in this movie at least, he's alone in the world, but he finds this other person, and he realizes that there's this darkness within her and within her life. And mm-hmm. she realizes there's a darkness within him and his life. But it's not like they don't judge each other about their past or something. It's like, okay, how do we uncover what they, this they, is? They do that in the first scene. And then the next scene, they're like, hey, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. And then like they say, like, okay, how do we go forward? How do we not even like fix it, but how do we live with it? Mm-hmm. How do we live around it? Which is like, I don't know. I kind of feel like that's that's all of our dreams. Right, or maybe not, not, maybe, be, not yeah. be judged for the past, but come up with someone who wants to go forward, or someone who recognizes that you have judged yourself for your past, maybe. Mm. Yeah. And as much as I am complaining about the book versus the movie, I do give the movie credit that love story is kind of better in the movie than it is in the book. They kind of they just flat out say, "I guess I'm in love with you," kind of yeah. you know, and just kind of they they have that moment that isn't necessarily explored more in the book and at the end of the book he um he kind of has a thing for eddie kane's wife and you know and uh once they find out carmen's the killer he's like you you have to go away with her so they they're not, they don't even end up together in the book so oh, yeah that's right yeah so it's you kind of miss out on that that love story that the movie gets you and i guess you know, that's how that's how you it's how you sell tickets. It's how you put butts in seats. Yeah. It's love stories. Yeah, and I guess that's the only way that the book kind of could end, right? Because he's Philip Marlowe, you know, is like the the archetype for this kind of hangdog, gumshoe, uh, private dick kind of thing, right? It's yeah. like in the Calvin and Hobbes, the Sam Spade character yeah. is, is Philip Marlowe, and if he ended up with a lady at the end, like, what are we doing? It's like We're, it's like yeah, he always has to be alone. Yeah, that's that's it. We can build him up, but then we have to kick him while he's down. Um, you know. That's the life of a PI in a noir. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the Mission Impossible movies. Yeah, he ends up with a new wo- new woman every different movie. So yeah, <laughs> it's possible. But then they always try and kill him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. But then maybe then connecting it to Fargo. Yeah, let's and connect to it to Fargo and Zodiac a little bit. That's a good idea. How do you think it's connect, Vito? Okay, so <laughs> it's easier with Zodiac, right? <laughs> it's a lot easier with Zodiac because. We're, we're, it's the same kind of labyrinthine plotting. It's a lot different because we got a detective, we have a new a cartoonist, and a newspaper, a crime reporter, all working to solve the case of the Zodiac. Of course, they're unsuccessful, but the movie does posit something. But in that sort of the the twisty alleyways of relationship and perspective, um, we do find some similarity with The Big Sleep. The Big Sleep is actually, though, usually just incredibly focused on Marlowe and what he's going yeah. through. And Zodiac has three central characters that it plays off of with maybe a slight head given to Graysmith. Fargo's a lot, a lot harder to tie back to this movie, but it's a lot easier to tie back into detecting. As far as detecting goes in this movie, it seems that Philip Marlowe is really good at making very good careful and genius suppositions of who did what and who was where and why (laughs) like he's brilliant at being like okay i saw that thing and that thing i'm not going to tell you that i saw those things but i did see them and i know this and i'm going to say this to you about that just to see what you're going to do and guess what that was a lie but you also lied and i knew that and there's a lot of that kind of back and forth thing which i think is really popular in these in these noir kind of movies but it's about manipulation more yeah. than it is about like seeing like scene situations or, or like seeing the layout of a room or yeah. something like that it's a lot less the sherlocking that you yeah. talked about sir and it's more about like can yeah. i get you to admit that you did something because <laughs> it sure seems like you did something a lot of lying and that's something that i think is very different about this movie than um, any of the other ones that we've covered is that he is a seeker of truth who 
never stops lying, right? In a way that, you know, Marge Gunderson in Fargo, you know, she never lies. Yeah. And in Zodiac, they don't have to lie. They're either on the side of the law or they're on the side of the free press. Right. What, right. How, how, does that seem fair to you, sir? I wouldn't necessarily, you know, um, tie these together, you know, yeah. it, other than the detective kind of aspect of it. I don't know. I think being a journalist is a lot like being a PI because I think my favorite part about these types of movies is just seeing somebody be, I don't know, bold and um, like, I don't know, something, something about watching PIs. They don't care about the, the social norms. They It's just walking into a place and I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It's just the the nature of detecting the nature of going to places that people won't go and, and saying, asking the questions and where a quote unquote normal, normal person would, you know, be more apprehensive or be scared to say this, say that a detective will, you know, walk into the so-and-so's office or hide behind the gate. And I don't know. It's just the, they have no fear. They have no fear of yeah, like breaking social yeah. norms or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And just here, like whenever, Eddie Kane had his gun out on him, just the, the balls on the guy, you know, just the, okay, well, I've had my gun drawn on, I had a gun drawn on me before, and, you know, other, other, <laughs> that kind of debonair and suave and, you know, some, something about having that confidence in yourself and your skill set that I, I really appreciate about these type of movies and detective movies in general. Like I said, again, you know, with journalists where they, you know, they go to the places and ask the questions. It's it's very similar in what they're doing with journalists and PIs. It's, they're just trying to solve problems and ask questions and get answers that nobody else can get or are scared to get or, you know, whatever, what have you. But, yeah, uh, just so far as tying it together, I haven't seen Zodiac in a while and Fargo in a longer while. But, you know, just the the detective aspects is kind of what I get from it. Yeah. 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 I thought one of the cool things that, that I liked, I don't know. I was thinking about maybe when I was watching this is, is the style that these are all of these take in terms of storytelling was very, very different. Coen brothers almost always give you something of a God's eye view of things in yeah. a way. Yeah. You know, each of the characters that are involved in, like you're following each of their plots in in Fargo, and you're just kind of waiting for them to to all crash together. Yeah, and that's the sense that that's that's almost like their signature move is to like you know what's going to happen is you're going to have a bunch of people who are all very weird, and they're all going to merge and crash in some sort of incredibly wild explosion. Yeah, and Zodiac, you never see the bad guy, <laughs> you never he- hear his actual voice a couple of times. Mm-hmm. There's this sense of dread. I mean, it's it's a very, like, the subjects are very different. Like, this is a serial killer. The other is a sort of accidentally, like, a small evil dude who ends up becoming hugely bad because of his associates. Yeah. And this one is more, about... More like a spree killer, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is about, like, small-time crooks who are all just kind of, like, they're bad. They're bad people. But everyone's kind of bad. And you have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Zodiac, you've got you do have a, a broader perspective, but you've got this sort of impending dread the whole time. Mm-hmm. You don't know what the answer is, and you ne- you know you're never gonna find out. Mm-hmm. With this, you only know as much as Philip Marlowe does, maybe even less. Yeah, I kind of like that about <laughs> this kind of movie, and, and like this is what I mean. Like this is made for me because it's just like. It's you're trying to make sense of it. it almost is a certain amount of, of reality and life to it that I I like, even though I doubt that Faulkner was trying to do this here. But it's like life. You, it feels like with any sort of major sort of situation that that I'm trying to figure out in my own life. It, like the first half of me trying to figure it out is me trying to figure it out, like being like it's got to go from A to B to C to D and all that. But by the end, I'm like, you know what? It's just going to work. Like this works. I love you. You know, nice. <laughs> that's, uh, and that's uh, that's something I don't know. I find endearing and enjoyable in this because by like by that point, I've given up on caring too much about about the plot. Just nice. the very very interesting different ways of approaching this sort of story or whatever. Um, 
so, sort of good person, at least, or good good person tries to figure out why bad person does bad thing. Yeah. A detective. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, do you guys have anything else to add to this sprawling... I, I feel like this episode is about as sprawling of a mess as, as the movie was. There was a murder. There was... <laughs> Jesse's gone. <laughs> Jesse's gone. You guys didn't even notice until now. Wow. We don't know who did it. <laughs> he was over Zoom, and now he, he's gone. We have not heard from him in hours now. Indeed. Yeah. Oh, yes. So uh, so with that, let's go ahead and ask our final question here, guys. Um, is this a dad movie? So I really wish Jesse was here because I'd like to – prefer to give you all a beating at the same time so he can hear this later but <laughs> so my biggest issue listening to your podcast is i very much disagree with your concept of what a dad movie is nice <laughs> love it so a lot of times when i hear you say this is a dad movie or isn't in my head i'm like that's more like a family movie i think the description you're giving it not necessarily a dad movie when i think dad movie i think of you know, John Wayne flicks. I think, uh, what's the what's the Ben Affleck one? Armageddon. He's climbing, no, when he's in the mountains or whatever. Oh in the goodness. mountains? Yeah. The one that just came in, out? Yeah, on Netflix. Oh my gosh. Triple Frontier? Triple yeah. Frontier. That's a dad movie in, in my head. I think of movies about guys and, you know, what have you. So... I couldn't wait to get on the podcast and, and, and pick them. And we were discussing a movie where you guys were going to say it's a dad movie. And I'm going to be like, no, that's absolutely not a dad movie. That's not what a dad movie is. But unfortunately, this is a dad movie. <laughs> this awesome. is absolutely a dad movie. You know, this is this is a movie dads watch. It's, you know, I, I picture my dad sitting in front of the TV watching, you know, black and white noir film. You know, so this... Unfortunately, I gotta agree with you guys. This is absolutely well. I'm, I'm agree with the concept. You know, this is absolutely a dad. I don't know whether you guys are gonna agree with me or not. But that's awesome. As far as dad movie goes, I gotta say this is absolutely a dad movie. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Do you want to? So I mean, I don't know. Do you want to talk about like like why sure. we don't think that's the only definition of a dad sure. movie? Sure. Because this is this is your thing, man. Yeah. Like this is. Sir and I have talked about it privately before, and so I'm not okay. going to be changing no one's mind here. But okay. for the <laughs> listeners to hear the other side from the people who do the show about the dad movies, uh, which I think is important here, your, your comments are valuable. We really appreciate them. And you're probably oh, yeah. right in a lot of ways. Uh, <laughs> what we tried to do with this show is we, first of all, I'd get bored if I had to watch those movies every single week and do a show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> number one. And then number two is that we wanted to expand that to be more stuff. We felt like the term dad movie was stereotypical. The whole reason we, we started this show was, the whole reason I had this idea is I was listening to an episode of the Slash Filmcast where they're telling Jeff Kanata that... I remember that episode. Yeah, that Greyhound yeah. is a dad movie. And Jeff's like, that's super Absolutely insulting. Absolutely a dad movie. You know? It's not. But that's when I started I... thinking about it. That's when I started going... Wait, what could a dad movie be? Could it be, it could be like stuffy historical epics. It could be old 1940s noir movies. It could be war films. But it could also be things that we as dads are super passionate about specifically because we want our kids to remember us like watching it with them or talking about it with them. And we also just wanted to have it be express some part of who we were, especially as we're like coming into having like, you just mentioned, uh, sir, you're going to be having a kid here soon. I'm also going to be having a kid in a couple months. <laughs> It, it's more and more on my mind about being a dad. <laughs> yeah, I, I got some news too here. I feel like Jesse should be here for this, but but I got number three is on the way over number here. Three. Oh wow! So we're all high five for hey, six, guys. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Congratulations! Absolutely. Uh, I've had it three but... times. <laughs> Good job. Wait, one more than either of you, right? <laughs> yeah. Am I right here? That's how it works, buddy. That's how, it works. That's how the world works. It's <laughs> oh, a dangerous batting average. Hundred <laughs> oh, percent of the time, it works but, all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like, so I mean, to speak on that episode in particular, I I think Jeff just super got it wrong. You know, I just. In my head, I guess his issue was that he he saw the term dad movie as a pejorative, yeah. and 
I I think of it like I just I agreed 100 percent with Dave's uh, theory as it's more of a just a kind of a label like rom com. It's just it's a term to describe a certain type of movie. It's neutral. It isn't negative. And when I think dad movie, I think of you know a certain type of movie where you know a a guy does this or I think it was uh, a guy's proven right or you yeah. know just you know a certain type of uh, it's a genre you know I, I don't think of it as a, a pejorative i don't think i'm saying anything negative i just think it's shorthand that when i say some so and so is a dad movie you kind of know the vibe of what type of movie i'm talking about so, yeah yeah and what we wanted we, to do is just expand about, it that's all we just wanted to make it well, bigger I'm, yeah, it was like 1950s Cinderella. I'm sorry, no, <laughs> no. Oh no, yeah. Do we say that one or did we yeah. say I the new Jesse one? Might have. I think oh, I said yeah, the Jesse new one because I, I just, yeah. I love the new one. Do you remember what I said? I don't remember what I said. I probably, don't know. probably yeah. I think he said. Okay, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I also think like we can't expand this. Like Fargo, yeah. Fargo is a. I'm stuttering here. Also knocking the mic around. Also knocking the mic. Well, while, while you collect your thoughts really briefly, I will say for those reasons, for a classical definition, you're you're you're, you're correct. It's a dad. It's what I would think well, of with a dad yeah, movie. Yeah, don't. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I apologize. Yeah, don't this apologize. Is your show. Oh I, yeah, don't, don't apologize. Don't, yeah, you know, I'm just yeah, I'm just you know giving my two cents as as to the thought. That's of why you're here, man. That's why you're here. We love we love your two cents. But what I am going to say is, for me, this is not what I would consider a dad movie. I. If I say it's not, it's by the barest of margins, and if I say it is, it's oh, also wow. by the barest of margins, because it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's also just not something that I feel deeply passionate about this movie in particular. Although I do very much about the whole genre of detective and noir, I'm just gonna say no. Okay. I'm gonna say no because there's other ones that I feel are much better at exemplifying this than than this. That's what I'm gonna say. Okay. So just just while you had time to, to think. Yeah, 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 for sure. No. So, all, I said all of that noise. I'm finally here to agree with you guys. <laughs> and you're like, and you're like, nope. This is this one is yeah, so. super arbitrary in why. the moment. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add to what you said though, also because I think a, a big part of it too is stuff that sort of made us people like the movies that we watched as kids that just like resonated when we were like learning what art and movies and we were as people and so those are kind of all over the place for me i know i think for you know yeah, i think absolutely. most of us right the stuff that resonated can't wait to call before before sunset a dad movie i can't wait <laughs> mm. i don't know if i'm ever gonna mm. do that <laughs> i don't know if i'm I, yeah i'll do it with sir if you don't want to yeah. do it okay <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah but uh but the, oh my hey. god oh, what from what the is dead this? from the grave he rises <laughs> he's back Hold on, I just hit okay. the record button again. Oh, so I'm recording. <laughs> That's okay. One, <laughs> <laughs> two, an hour later. Um, yeah. Okay, so so Sir said that it is not. It is a dad movie. Vito said it's not. I have been caveating, so you're gonna go next. You know, okay, okay. Here's where I'm at. I, I've been realizing recently that I have like very few movies to show my kids over the years. Is this gonna be one of them? I just. I just don't think this. Would, I, like, there's. I think there's valid reasons to make it one, right? It's got Bogart. It's a classic noir film, but is this one that I think they're really going to be into? No. Um, How do you define dad movie? That's a great question. I define dad movie as either something I really want to pass on to my kids or something I thoroughly enjoy myself, and I don't care if my kids like it. It's like a staple for me and my friends and anybody else who. I think falls in this realm of dad dadness. Does that make sense? Like there, there are some movies that growing up that my dad watched and like, it didn't matter if I was a kid and I enjoyed it with him. It was like, it was something I always saw. I always saw him watching. And I think my kids are going to associate with me. That's another genre of dad film to me. So like, I think star Trek was definitely my dad's dad movies. Like I did not like those things, but man, he got into star Trek, <laughs> right? <laughs> But that was never my thing, but I'm always going to associate that with him. So I have, like, neither of those two things going for me with this movie. Like, I'm not going to sit down and just enjoy this, and they're going to be like, oh, Dad's watching the big <laughs> sleep again. I, <laughs> I don't think that's ever going to happen. And, like, I understand its importance in film history, but I'm never going to, like... I don't want to say never, but I never... <laughs> I don't want to say really never. <laughs> <laughs> 
You don't, you don't, that, you don't care about that them about seeing this movie. my feelings. You don't care about them seeing this movie. I don't. So you might put it on if it's it, on, like... Yeah. Oh, they're going to make a comeback. If, if Netflix still exists 20 years from now, then sure. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I think I'm going to say it's a dad movie. I'm going to agree with you, sir. And I'm going to disagree with you guys. Because, now, like, I think, I, I think there are a lot better detective movies out there than this. Ones that are tighter ones that do the things that this is doing better but it is such a part of history and, and part of what i think i'm looking at here is like partly what defined me what educated me things that i'd also just throw on at any time i think it would be awesome if every time i went to take a nap i said i'm gonna go watch the big sleep uh, and i just turn on the big sleep and so my kids just assume wait, that's a thing I, wait i got a question mike what's gonna happen when you're super old and you say that for the last time they'll laugh and it'll be great. I'll go out to laughter. Um, <laughs> Jesse's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, no um, I don't think because of that, I think it's going to be, um, because I, I think it's important. I want to educate them. I want to kind of feed this into their brains at some point when they're young because I, I think that it's okay to. And uh, it's something that will sort of foster and fester a love for this sort of thing is something that they'll be able to use as a touchstone as they get older which is something that i did without really realizing it yeah so it really is important to you and you and you really do want to want your kids to associate yeah. this movie with yeah. you yeah i think so yeah. that's why sounds like yeah. sounds like great reasons it's a good reason it actually sounds like both, movie both for you. yeah sir and you have great reasons and jesse and i have great reasons yeah. because it's still arbitrary, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we're all just we're trying to find someone in the darkness to Say I love you in the car, too. Yep. That's that's it, Mike. That's the <laughs> deal. You know what? <laughs> you know, if if it comes down to it and we need, like, a consensus to make this a dad movie or not, though, I, I'd be willing to say that this is a dad movie. It has to withstood the test of time, right? Father's I mean, Sounds sound like we got three yeah. out of four. And Vito! <laughs> Vito was wobbling! <laughs> hey, Vito. Don't you think film is important? <laughs> oh, film, film is deeply important. You guys remember that scene in Wolf of Wall Street when he has to like give up the practice and he's leaving and everyone's like, "No, don't go!" And he starts to he starts to walk out and he comes back and he goes, "I'm not f- leaving." Yeah, that's me. I'm not leaving. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Three out of four is where it's gonna lie. I just maybe at the end of the year, if we do like a retrospective kind of thing, looking back over the the movies we've thrown up in the Hall of Fame, um, I might reconsider. But I'm I'm gonna need some time to sit with this one. And I'm probably going to have to read the dang book. Yeah. That's what I'm probably going to have to do. Actually, you know what? I, I, I will. I will read the book. Dude. You guys, you guys have given me. I'm going to read the book. It's a good book. I'm gonna it's, book. It's, a, it's a lot of fun. You, know, you too, Jesse. You know what's fun is I watched the trailer for this movie. And the trailer for The Big Sleep is Humphrey Bogart walking into a bookstore, picking up The Big Sleep, and reading it in front of the camera. With Lauren oh Bacall gosh. being like, oh, you'd really nice. like that book. That's hilarious. Yeah, it's like the courtiest trailer ever and it's so great it made my day watching that so i guess i have to read the book in order to really get the movie because that's what they pitched this movie on. they told you to do he's got to read the book you guys are right all right so it is a dad movie it is a dad movie three out of four say so so majority rules the three-quarter dad it's it's a dad movie it's a dad missing a leg um from all of us here at not your father's movies thank you so much i'm mike i'm vito i'm jesse they call me sir good night